Hi, Alex Williams of the New Stack here with Joshua Long, Principal Developer Advocate at Pivotal. Hey, Josh. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we're gonna do a tutorial today, a demo, screencast, so to speak. But I thought it might be helpful for you to first tell us who you are, and then we can get into the demo. Right, well, my name is Josh Long. I'm a Principal Technology Advocate on the uh, on the advocacy, advocacy team over at Pivotal, and I focus on helping users and organizations better build applications uh, that exploit a modern platform, a platform like uh, our Cloud Foundry, you know, a cloud platform. And the reason we do this, the reason we're so often uh, out there helping people kind of get come to grasp uh, these concepts is because a lot of organizations are struggling with the need to go faster. They want to be able to deliver software safely and efficiently into production. And so that's been sort of our rallying cry over at Pivotal. Uh, we've seen so many organizations struggle with how do, how do I move from concept to production very quickly. And of course, a lot of, a lot of what we're doing in, in modern engineering, software engineering these days sort of focuses on uh, quali quantity of iterations and velocity of iterations over quality, right? So TDD and uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery and uh, all these other sort of buzzy wordy things all have to do with the ability of, of us to get faster feedback, to get new ideas and then iterate on them faster, 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 so as to deliver something ultimately into, into production. And we've seen organizations struggle with moving software into production and sort of a natural uh, recourse is to move to smaller batches of work, smaller batches of work so that I can iterate on something very small, test it. I don't have to worry about stabilizing and integrating code from a large team with hundreds of people. Uh, and once I've got that small batch of work, I want to be able to then deploy it, stand it up, service it, and, and so on. Well, that, that small batch of work for software, that's a, that's a microservice. And so st organizations struggle with finding the right boundaries of those microservices, and there's a lot of discussion to be had around that as well. But these microservices, in order for, in order for them to work, you have to be able to stand up applications that are consistent, that have sort of the trappings of a, of a service that you can move into production that your organization will approve of, right? The, the, the enemy here is, is that famed, pained uh, wiki page inside the organization detailing all 50 or 100 steps you need to, to follow before you can stand up a service in production. These things that are non-functional requirements that date our ability to move code, but that must be addressed, but they're not business differentiators. Nobody's going to pat you on the back and say, well done, you, you added a health check, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not interesting code. Um, as my, uh, you know, the faster we can deploy software, the, the, the better our ability to respond. And um, I, my friend Andrew Schaefer, he talks about that. He says, uh, uh, you're either building a software business or you're going to be beaten by somebody uh, who is, right? And I, and I believe in that wholeheartedly. I think if you're trying to move software, you know, um, going fast is important. So what I would like to talk to you about today is Spring Boot. It's a way of consistently standing up services and kind of codifying that checklist so you don't have to constantly repeat all this error-prone stuff, you know. Interesting. Okay. So why don't you uh, do a demo for us and share your screen and, and take us uh, through a little tour? So uh, we're going to go ahead and begin our little journey here on uh, the Spring Initializer, start.spring.io. Uh, the Spring Initializer is just that. It's a little web service that you can access. There's integration with all common IDEs, so NetBeans, IntelliJ, the uh, Spring Tool Suite, which is an Eclipse uh, variant. Uh, you go here and you choose the bits you'd like to use. So I'm going to build a, a quick service, a very sort of hypothetically, uh, nonsensically trivial, hypothetical kind of example. Um, and I'll call it the reservation service. And I want to support certain kinds of workloads. So um, I can either auto-complete my way to, to glory here. I can say I want to use JPA and web and the actuator and REST repositories. Um, and then H2, which is an in-memory embedded database for quick uh, development, sort of like SQLite or uh, Access or something like that. Um, or I could have gone down here and chosen the checkboxes and there's a lot, right? There's a lot of different use cases that are well supported by these technologies, including a, a second layer sort of on top of Spring Boot that addresses the non-functional requirements that are implied when you 
start standing up lots of small services, lots of microservices, you are now squarely in the, uh, in the camp of distributed computing. That's, that requires a, a different approach, right? You have to deal with those patterns. So to support that, we've got, we've got something called Spring Cloud, which perhaps we can talk about that um, later. So I've just clicked generate. I've got a new zip file. And this is going to uh, give me a you know, stock standard uh, Maven project. I could have have, I could have just as easily have chosen a, a Gradle based build or, or whatever. You can open up your IDE. Again, it doesn't matter which. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand up a nonsensically sim uh, simple um, service that just stands up an API and uh, look at some of the non-functional requirements that we don't have to worry about. So here we go. I've got a public static void main. This is a uh, entry point into the application. I'm gonna build a, an entity here. Can you see the font? Is that? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna build a, a straw man entity, something we can just work with just uh, for an example. It's gonna be a reservation. Uh, it's gonna be something that you know holds a name in the database. Uh, because it's in the database, I'm gonna map it to that database using JPA, which is a, a mapping layer. Again, you can use whatever you want. We have support for Mongo, or Couchbase, or React, or Cassandra, or Redis, or whatever, but this works with a relational data store pretty well. I'm gonna use the ID and add generated value ID annotations, uh, and I'm gonna create accessors for this for the uh, object here. I'll create a constructor so that we have easy, you know, an easier time of uh, newing up new instances. And I'll create a two string method so we have something we can look at, and that'll do. And now I wanna be able to handle, I wanna create you know, sample, sample record so we can see it in action. So of course I need to create, read, update, and delete that data. So I'll use a repository, the Martin Fowler pattern, you know, the design pattern, um, a bit of indirection between the business code and the actual persistence tier. So in this case, I'm gonna create an interface which is going to have methods uh, whose implementations will be automatically provided by uh, Spring, da Spring Data, which is automatically stood up and configured for us using Spring Boot, which is what we're using now. And this interface I'm using is, is specific for JPA, but there are analogs that support similar, although not always the same because of the limitations of the underlying technologies, uh, and indeed because of the uh, strengths of the underlying technologies. So there's Mongo repositories, Cassandra repositories, et cetera. There are methods in the, in the super type, find all, delete, save, ID, et cetera. And here, once I've done that, I can even stand up uh, custom finder methods so I'll say find by reservation name, string rn, and uh, that is enough. If I wanted to then create a component, something that was stood up when the application gets initialized, when it, when it runs, um, I'll say dummy data um, CLR implements command line runner, this is an interface, it's a callback interface that the uh, framework, the container, uh, will call once the application has initialized itself, and I will tell the container, that is to say Spring, to give me a collaborating object, a, an object that implements this reservation repository contract, and there, I'll uh, just add some, some, uh, some data. So Alex, do the... Etc. Okay, and okay. What's, got some names in there. I'm going to go through the collection of names, add some names to the database using the repository there, just to save some simple records, and then we'll use the uh, repository to uh, sort of iterate through everything that we've got in the database, getting a collection, and then printing out each record using Java 8 lambdas here. I'm a Java champion, by the way. I'm a Java champion, by the way, and that that uh, you know, it pleases me to be able to stand here and show lambdas in, you know, 2018. Mm. <laughs> so I'm going to say find by reservation name. We'll do the predicate example there as well. And uh, there we are. So now we've got something written in the data. I'm going to start it and initialize it, and if, by virtue of the fact that got H2 on the class path, which is an in-memory embedded database, it'll automatically in instantiate a sort of a, an instance of that data source and write to it. Uh, but I could otherwise 
explicitly provide a data source if I had like, you know, something like a Postgres or MySQL or whatever. I see. So that in-memory database is a, is a critical part here, isn't it? Indeed. It gives us a, the ability to just start working. But of course, in a real application, you're not going to, you're not going to discard the buffer of, of, of memory every single time the app starts. So right. it's, good for, it's good for a quick development, but you'll quickly grow out of it. So here we go. We have uh, down here all the simple data in the database, nothing fancy, just to confirm that the find all worked and then find by reservation name worked. Uh, but this is 2015, so naturally I need a, a REST API. You know, there's an existential question. If you, mm. if you write data to the database and nobody can access it via REST, did you actually write it? Uh, <laughs> So we could stand up a <clears throat> standard REST controller using Spring MVC. So I can say reservation REST controller, and I'll say at autowired private reservation repository like that. Um, and just, you know, generally I'm going to ex expose an endpoint. I'll say get equals uh, reservations. And this is just, uh, you know, standard HTTP get uh, call to read reservation data, and there we are. If I restart, that'll come up again. And because I've got Spring MVC on the, uh, on the I've got the support for standing up Spring MVC, this will automatically see that I've got uh, a REST, you know, MVC controller component, and it'll start up an embedded web server. So now I don't have that gap, that drift uh, between, you know, the, the container and what the developers are working on now that they're sort of codified in the same thing, localhost reservations, and there's our data. But if you think about it, this is a lot of code just to get a simple REST API. So what I really want to do is I want to map the creation, reading, updating, and deleting of that of those business entities to the uh, to the repositories, basically. So instead of doing it the hard way, I'll just actually let the repository do the work for me. I'll say repository REST resource, and I'll map the finder method even. Uh, using by name, annotating the attribute so that it also is part of uh, the ultimate service that we stand up here. And then I'll restart. Now, if we go back to our, our service here on the, uh, in the browser, we can see the old output. But what I really want to see is the new one, right, which is the same kind of stuff. I've got the same payloads as before, but even better, in my code here, I've got links. These links tell us what the client can do with the payload that he or it is looking at, right? This is the uh, the uh, resource for each record. That's I can deep link through it, you know. And this these links are very critical here. We see this all the time in HTML output when you use style sheets. These links tell the client what the what the payload is and where where it can go with that payload. But they're stateful. So, for example, a shopping cart might have products in them. Well, naturally, you wouldn't have a, a shopping cart link to, to get a refund on something you haven't paid for, right? So these links right. give you the ability to know where you can go and where you can't go. And they also decouple the client from the actual URI structure, right? the topology of the URIs. So if I someday, for some business-driven reason, decide to change the API topology, I'm not breaking the client because they're going to go to the, the link rel right here, this, this thing here. And you can insert your own as well. I can even go to the reservation search endpoint here. And I can see there's a finder method here, just like we uh, stood up. And I can say, find by our name, rn equals Alex. And there's the re result come back for just that one record. This is called hypermedia, or uh, hypermedia is the engine of application. So it is, it, it hypermedia has become a concept that's being talked more about. What is the value of it here? Well, it's self-describing APIs, right? You're, you're, if, as you move to this microservices world, you want to stand up lots and lots of APIs. If you were going to do that, you want to make sure that these things take as much care of themselves as possible and that you're not beholden to uh, documentation, which we know will ultimately drift, you know. So now I've got an application. It's a REST API. It's pretty trivial, I grant you, but it does work. I can post, I can delete, I can get, I can um, put, etc. But I talked about production, right? And uh, if you've ever read Michael Nygaard's amazing tome, uh, Release It, you know that the last mile um, between Production and code complete is, is a very long mile indeed. Code complete is not the same as production ready. And so there's a lot of things that gate that move, things like health checks, things like environment information. So if I go to ENV, for example, on my browser, I can actually see now all the properties, all the sort of system 
environmental attributes uh, you know, in one dump, one sort of screen. This is a good way to sort of see what is different from one environment to another. And I've even got my environment variables, things like that. That's all here. Of course, the, uh, the sensitive bits like my, my keys, for example, are masked off, so I'm not really uh, at any risk of anything interesting being shown, but it does help me isolate configuration differences between one environment and, and another. And mind you, uh, that's an important thing, right? If you're using a modern cloud platform uh, or even just any kind of container technology, the way you inform the behavior of the application is through environment variables, right? So Cloud Foundry, mm -hmm. Docker, all of them use environment variables. So ENV is a good use, useful endpoint. Uh, mappings, if you're concerned about regulatory purposes, mapping shows you all the things you need to know to, to uh, you know, wh what endpoints are stood to, stood up and exposed to traffic, which component handles them. Uh, trace shows you the basic request log of the of the application. You know, requests that have been made by default the last 100 into the system. Their HTTP verbs and their their uh, mappings, their paths, their headers, and all that. There's health. Health is something we all write. It's very boring, boilerplate kind of code. It's, you know, if you've got a load balancer and uh, your service is sick, you need some sort of endpoint to say that. And uh, if a good health point uh, doesn't lie. So this actually uses the correct status codes and all that. And you can customize all this as well, right? That's the whole point. <clears throat> so there's a, you know, there's also metrics. Metrics shows you host and, uh, and system kind of information as well as if you like semantic metrics, like how many orders were processed or how many items are in people's, people's shopping carts, etc., You can add, emit your own me metrics and then view them in a single joined up view. You also get an enumeration of how many requests were made to each endpoint and their status code. So here, for example, I can see that I made one request to forward slash reservations, got a status code of uh, 200, which is okay. Uh, I made one request to forward slash ENV, status code of 200, etc. So all these endpoints and more give you the ability to now monitor and, and understand what your system is doing. When you move to okay. microservices, that's important. You don't want to drive blind, right? We don't, we don't drive cars without gauges and with flat on the windshield. Uh, and no sooner should we stand up services. And then running this, of course, uh, you know, fun, we imagine that uh, a lot of developers, a lot of uh, organizations are moving to a cloud platform today. So managing the, the, the sort of life cycle of this application, starting it, stopping it, talking to it, you know, reading its logs, all that stuff is just something you can very, very readily handle with uh, something like a cloud foundry. So this is now a so-called fat jar. So if I go to my desktop here or yeah, downloads directory, CD reservation service, I'm going to do maven minus D skip test. That is to say I'm going to compile it and not run the unit test for the moment for lack of time. If I go to the target directory, I've got a self-contained jar uh, that contains everything I need to be able to run this application. Indeed, I could actually uh, chunk this into a, an email and, and send it to, to somebody who's got the ability to run applets and they could run this. It, it doesn't get much simpler, uh, except if you're using a, a modern cloud platform. Again, at that point, it just becomes CS, CS push minus P, this, and then, you know, reservations, right? And that'll eventually be, be stood up and then and, and uh, available for traffic on Cloud Foundry, on a Cloud Foundry instance, which is natural, right? You've got, it's a self-contained binary. You can promote it from one environment to another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's Spring Boot. Uh, we, we did a very quick tour of the, uh, of the tech. But, um, well, that's, that's great. Uh, it's a good uh, basic overview. It gives a, you know, a, a good, in, overview of, of, of what it offers. Joshua, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk with us here at the new stack about, um, you know, about what you're doing over at Pivotal. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Great. Happy okay. holiday. Happy holiday. Thanks a lot. Cheers.